Okay, so uh, in fact, I'm going to really talk about a world that is no longer existed. Now, of course, I wouldn't be talking about this um, had the pandemic not struck us all within the last uh, uh, three or four months, basically, then I'd probably be talking about uh, sprawl and compactness and uh, similar sorts of things and building on uh, different perspectives, uh, uh, such as Chris Segris has been doing. Uh, but I'm really going to talk about how our models uh, are being changed, if you like, by this whole question about contact and social distances. So what I'm going to do is basically, uh, well, I put the PDF on, a, on a, my blog, basically. You can actually download it from that. So there's quite a bit of material in the presentation. Uh, you can look at this in, um, uh, in a little more, more detail at your leisure in sense. And I will actually uh, go over some of these slides rather quickly. There's quite a lot written, basically, but I'll actually summarize the main things. And then we'll get on to examples which are mainly graphical, mainly illustrative in that sense. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say something about disruptive events. That One of the kind of key issues in terms of thinking about the city uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is the notion about the network. And a lot of work is beginning to be done on what happens when a network goes down, when a, a link on a traffic system actually breaks or when some node gets closed, et cetera. Uh, and, of course, there's, uh, the interesting notion is that there, are, that there are then cascades, cascading effects, uh, which run through the network. A lot of network science that's been developed is really all about these cascades. Now, of course, in some senses, uh, the most disruptive event of all would be where all the links begin to break or most of them begin to break and most of the nodes have been closed down. And what's been happening over the last three or four months is that that indeed has happened in many, many uh, nations, many, many societies around the world. And that changes our whole concept of distance, relationships, contact, uh, density, and so on. So I'll be talking about how can our models begin to be tested in some sense and extended to talk about those. I want to talk about one of the central things in terms of thinking about models of cities, and that is distance, really, and density. It goes by the name of Tobler's Law. It basically relates to how near we can get to one another, or indeed the action at a distance, how important distance is in actually relating to movement and volumes, etc. It's very central. Chris Greegrass in his talk uh, showed, for example, I think, um, how knowledge intensity has had a much steeper fall off with, uh, with distance than, say, uh, manufacturing and so on. In other words, there are many, many phenomena that really relate to the impact of distance where you get regular change, non-linear change as you move away from a place or as you get nearer a place. And that really is pretty central. Now, of course, if we actually um, have very major limits on our contact, and of course, uh, the limits on our contact at the moment are in fact trying to avoid uh, becoming infected by the, uh, by the Corona-19 virus, basically. If we have those sorts of limits, then basically uh, what happens is that our models in some sense really have to be massively adjusted in some sense. They may no longer even be relevant in this particular context. So I'll say a little bit about what we know about that in some sense, and then think about how we can modify our models. One of the things that I think which is intriguing with respect to thinking about the impact of this pandemic on uh, density and congestion, compactness, sprawl and so on, is that the very large scale for the first time is being linked to the very small scale. If I want to travel between uh, London and Moscow, for example, I'm fairly bound to actually take an aeroplane. But of course, on an aeroplane, how can you avoid social distancing? How can you pack people onto an aeroplane? I saw some pictures yesterday of EasyJet, for example, taking off from Luton. Uh, they've begun to start some flights again. Um, and it really didn't look as though people were any different in terms of their social distancing from what they've been in the past, basically. So to some extent, to actually travel very large distances, we also have this notion of the small scale uh, in some sense. And for the first time, we really might think that some of our models of the large scale might actually be linked quite importantly to the, the small scale in that sense. So then I'd like to look at three examples. OK, I'm very conscious that... Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we're packing the time in here, basically. Uh, but I want to really look at the very fine scale. I want to look at contact at urban design. And the example I'll look at is uh, in terms of supermarkets. Then I want to look at uh, building large-scale models of national systems um, and how we can be begin to build uh, um, 
uh, infection, innovation, a whole range of distance-related effects, if you like, uh, into large-scale models with a, with a focus on uh, uh, this notion about um, uh, social distancing. And then I want to look at our uh, one of our workhorse models that we have in, in our group called the quant model, which again is, uh, uh, is even larger in scale. It's really for uh, the United Kingdom, basically. And that really relates to the notion that small-scale effects can have very big scale effects in some sense, and I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, and that really, uh, those examples will be looked at in terms of scenarios, a couple of those, and then I'll actually uh, post some questions about where we go from here. Uh, now, uh, Natalia, in fact, has posed a number of questions like uh, um, Antonia did for, uh, for Chris, basically. Uh, uh, Antonio, uh, Natalia has uh, uh, given me some questions in that sense, and these really relate to the limits of models to some extent. And one of the features of this talk, I think, this afternoon is that, in some senses, the, the, the pandemic at the present time is testing us with respect to how robust our models are. Can they actually be adapted to deal with very strange kind of effects? Now, of course, it may well be that um, uh, within the next year or so, uh, many of these uh, issues pertaining to the pandemic relating to distance and so on and density will in fact change and we will revert to a normal. But it will take time even at that point, And therefore, it is important it may well have lasting effects. OK, very quickly then, the, the network analogy. Now, we've really look at, uh, I've really mentioned these sort of things. Um, breaks in the links or the closure of networks, these are in, in events that, that are generated from actions in that sense. But nothing could really prepare us for the set of events that have happened in the last uh, three or four months. Whole parts of the network have been closed down in this context. So in the UK, for example, the lockdown has led to about 80% of people working from home or not working or working from home in some sense. That's a massive change. 20% uh, uh, of the population, are, the employment population, are regarded as uh, essential workers. In that sense, we've seen a decline of 20% in GDP, in income, basically, uh, in April alone. And, of course, that's difficult to measure, whether we measure it over months or years, etc., uh, in terms of fixed capital or variable incomes and so on. Uh, that's an important issue, but it's very, very substantial, of course. People say that it's unprecedented. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, about 30% of all UK employment is actually being funded at the moment in terms of income uh, by government until October. Now, these are really very dramatic changes. And the notion of the, the network going down in little bits and looking at repercussions is really beyond our experience. The network, uh, many of our networks have really gone down quite dramatically. OK, and of course, coming out of this lockdown uh, is equally problematic, if not more problematic in some sense. And this is all set against a background of us having very little idea about this virus, how it's transmitted. It's remarkable. Uh, and of course, I'm involved in a, with a group of scientists uh, who are looking at these sorts of things. It's quite remarkable how little is actually known about the virus. Uh, in terms of the, its transmission in small spaces, etc., in enclosed spaces, etc. So it's against this, this massive uncertainty uh, that we really need to have to think about uh, what our models actually tell us about this. Okay, so distance is really critical to this. Uh, our models are based on distance. Of course, before the Industrial Revolution, before modern technologies, um, distance was uh, a constraining factor. Most people didn't walk more than about six miles a day. I think the average was probably about three miles a day uh, in some sense. Now, of course, in big cities, and this was, is very key in terms of all the presentations this afternoon, most of the pictures we've seen of cars, etc., people are traveling probably on average either by mass transit or cars uh, in, in industrialized cities, basically, something in the, in the order of about one hour a day, etc. That is being massively changed by what's happening at the present time. OK, so, of course, if we have to change the density of how we travel uh, because of capacity limits, basically, social distancing, uh, then we're simply not able to travel the kind of distances we have in the past. And, of course, how we move locally within small spaces is also massively changed in this sense. So let me have a quick look at some of the, uh, some of the, the ways we'll look at this. For example, here's a picture of London. These are retail locations in a big city like London. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, you, you only need to look at the map to see the distance and movement is em employed in that. Well, that just shows you uh, retail locations. Here's a picture um, of uh, at a much smaller scale. This is a, 
a parade or an example from a parade in uh, in West Central London. Uh, basically, the, uh, the it's an Asian based model in that sense, and uh, basically the parade is highly crowded. Um, the, the spectators who are the red dots uh, uh, around the parade basically uh, show uh, show the pressure on the parade. So crowding and contact is all important in that concert. Whether or not uh, within the next couple of years, if the pandemic subsides in some sense, and if we're able to control it, we may return to those sorts of crowding events. But this is a classic case where um, if that kind of crowding event were to occur tomorrow, for example, then clearly, um, and the infection was not wiped out of the system, then we really have some problems. Uh, here, for example, is a, a supermarket. Uh, it's quite a large supermarket, and it shows the little red dots, the color of the dots show the possible infections. And what's going on at the present time is lots of the uh, very traditional solutions to congestion, such as one-way streets and so on, are being introduced into uh, spaces of this kind. So the one-way systems in supermarkets is a very favorite sort of employ uh, very, very possibility. In fact, um, some of the research I'll mention a little bit later uh, indicates that, um, uh, and I suppose this is quite controversial, that uh, some of these one-way systems are, which are being introduced are actually leading to a, the possibilities of greater infections, uh, largely because people spend more time in the supermarket, they can therefore bump into uh, other people or pass other people, even in the one-way system uh, in that context. So there's some interesting uh, counterintuitive effects in, in terms of these sorts of things here. Okay, now I'm going to race. Uh, I'm going to ra race through some of these points in that sense that uh, capacity, density, uh, spacing, the amount of travel, etc., uh, and the technology we use to travel are all being changed. One of the great paradoxes I think that's happening in this particular context is that um, people are clearly walking and biking much more, but at the same time they're avoiding mass transit. They're avoiding public transport in that sense, and they're moving to their cars. So we have this strange paradox of more local, more walkable, uh, in that sense, in the local level, but at the same time, to travel any distance at, at all, moving away from mass transit, in that sense, towards towards uh, towards public transport, uh, sorry, towards uh, private transport, which is road traffic. And, of course, some of our models, which uh, really were the modes of travel compete with one another are indicating that if we have if we can if we control the capacity of our mass transit systems and it appears that uh, mass transit can only really uh, be capacitated at about 20 percent we can only get 20 percent of people back onto the transits and the buses and so on uh, in this context uh, without breaking these these so-called rules of social distancing uh, then basically what actually happens is that people take to their cars or they take to walking and in that context, um, th that uh, the cities are moving towards gridlock, potentially towards gridlock uh, in this context. So some interesting features in this particular context. Here's an example of, um, uh, of how we can actually show uh, the impact. Uh, on the left, you've got uh, a picture of the, these are all the roads in Britain, about, um, uh, uh, about uh, three and a half million uh, street segments, basically defining, the, uh, defining uh, Great Britain. Uh, and then you see the railways. What we've actually done in our models, we have models of this sort, and I'll mention them a little bit later. What we've actually done in this particular context is to actually um, uh, move people off the railways, reduce the amount of rail travel to about 80%. Uh, and the picture on the right shows the, uh, the congestion that takes place um, uh, simply because of this movement in some sense. So you could think of this as a decrease in accessibility due to the, uh, the imposition of the capacity constraints on rail in that sense. Okay, now I'm going to go over this very quickly, but basically we know quite a lot, I think, about, um, uh, about relationships in terms of distances. Uh, and of course, all these relate really to the inverse, the inverse squirrel, or the idea that um, as we move away from a place, uh, the amount of travel or the amount of movement declines uh, inversely, according to some power or a negative exponential function, uh, in a sense, from this particular place. So we can say that the amount of movement uh, relates inversely to the, the travel cost or the, uh, or the distance, etc., away from it. And these are the familiar sorts of graphs. You can see on this graph here, the basic idea is that uh, uh, movement falls off with distance from a particular point. Uh, that's true of the way we travel. It's true indeed, of, or we think it's true, of the way the virus spreads, uh, 
uh, this kind of inverse decay phenomenon is 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 central uh, to to many many activities that we actually have in that sense. If we want to find out the amount of people who are travelling to that point, the point zero, uh, the origin, if you like, or the destination in this sense, then we can add up the area under the curve in that sense. So add the area under the curve, and we can work out how many people. Uh, travel in that way. Many of our models are based on this. And you can see that if we change the shape of the curve, meaning that as the curve gets flatter and bigger in that sense, more people are traveling, distance or travel cost is less uh, significant in that sense, then the amount of tra people traveling to a particular place actually increases. So if we add up in this particular way, what's happening here? Okay, yeah. We had it in that particular way. Okay, so let's actually have a quick look at the fact that when people get to a place, of course, that's not the that could well be the beginning of their contact, etc. They've got to get to a place in some sense. Our models depend on that. When they get to a particular place, um, uh, we look at the relationship between them. So, for example, if we have 25 people traveling to a place, then we've got potentially 25 squared interactions basically at that place. Of course, they don't all interact at the points. They spread out in some senses. So we have local interactions in this particular way. And to some extent, what I'm beginning to suggest here is that the notion of our long, longer distance travel has to be linked to short distance travel to begin to explain what's actually happening at the present time in the way we're adjusting to uh, these questions of distancing and so on. Okay, let me move very quickly through this, basically. We can work out, for example... Uh, in terms of these sorts of equations, uh, what the potential rates of infection are at particular points. How we actually uh, minimize that infection is the all-important kind of planning question in this particular way. Okay, let me move very quickly. So, so in this sense, is we're linking the very large scale to the very small scale for the first time. So if you like, we're linking uh, transportation modeling at the national scale or the metropolitan scale. We're linking that, if you like, to what goes on within buildings and supermarkets in some sense. And to get a handle on, on, on new patterns of movement, we really begin to need to do this in some sense. And that's really quite new, that we tend to have thought in the past in terms of silos, for obvious reasons, certain models for certain scales in a sense. Uh, but in some senses, to be able to make sense of what's actually happening at the present time. We nearly, really need to link, link the very large scale to the very small scale in that way. So there's a bunch of uh, notion about capacity limits in this sense. So let me have a look uh, at uh, three types of urban model in this sense, uh, which illustrates some of these issues. First of all, I want to look at the very fine scale. I've mentioned this, the supermarkets. Then at the national scale, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing there. And then finally, uh, in terms of long-term change. So the first one, the fine scale is in terms of the supermarkets. There's a picture uh, on the top right of, um, of a smaller supermarket, basically, where it shows that the infected person in red uh, infects the person in black. And, of course, the layout of the supermarket makes a difference. That's what, of course, uh, all of this sort of uh, analysis is designed to look at. Uh, then we have um, an example of a pandemic model, basically, uh, for a county, a spatial pandemic model. Uh, and then we can look at a whole variety of things relating to transportation changes uh, with respect to our national model. So three different scales, in a sense, from the building scale to the uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the county scale through to the uh, national scale. And we have models for all of these things. Putting them together, of course, is, uh, in this sense, new. Okay. What do we know about uh, supermarkets at the very fine urban scale in this context? Here's the picture of the supermarket again. Well, uh, there's some interesting features. Of course, we can begin to alter uh, movement patterns by one-way systems and so on uh, in terms of the supermarket itself with the notion that a particular system might avoid uh, contact. Of course, um, most people think that uh, the viral load uh, in terms of a supermarket is quite, is quite light that most people don't spend, you know, five or ten minutes talking to each other in a supermarket in this sense. Uh, they spend uh, only a, a fraction of seconds, basically. So the possibility of it being infected in a supermarket is probably fairly low in this context. But it's not negligible. And, of course, one of the kind of issues about it is that um, we really just don't know. We don't have uh, much sense. You've probably seen these pictures of people coughing and the virus actually spreading among the shelves. These are very familiar in the UK in terms of the media at the present time. 
Uh, but basically, at the end of the day, um, we really don't know very much about this in some sense. We're in the dark. Now, what we found out in this particular context, or I should say what we've found out, uh, uh, what the group doing this have found out, and they're using uh, data from um, uh, a national supermarket chain here. Uh, of course, the national chain are very reluctant uh, for this work to be published because uh, they don't want the, uh, the, the stores to be associated with infections. But basically, uh, you can see these graphs indicate that the number of uh, uh, customers actually uh, moving to the store, uh, the rate of customer arrival, basically, I should say, is, is non-linearly associated with the possibility of infections, basically. Uh, so arrivals and queuing uh, in this particular context are really quite important in, in, this, in this respect. Uh, this particular work has gone on to look at, here's a bigger supermarket, the same chain, basically, uh, and this actually shows you the um, uh, shows you the uh, the uh, the potential of infection, basically dependent on certain layouts. Now, of course, uh, as we know, for in in many uh, planning applications of this kind, there are li really almost an infinite number of possibilities of um, uh, of uh, arranging things in some sense in the market. In that sense, so the challenge, of course. Uh, and this is, of course, where we need to know more about the virus spread, basically. The challenge is to actually uh, relate the organization inside of the store. And, of course, this generalizes to any kind of building, you know, a station, a mall, uh, anything like this in this context, even a school, for example. Uh, this is the kind of nature of, nature of the problem. Okay, uh, there's another group uh, who we're involved in, which is uh, building a, a spatial pandemic model. You might think that... Um, the pandemic modelers uh, know all about geography, but far from it in some sense. That, uh, uh, In some sense, it would appear that the geography of things, the spatial uh, dimension, is, is increasingly important as we learn more about these things, basically. But generally speaking, the, the spatial pandemic models are really very simple. They're simply positive feedback models where people uh, get infected and they infect others, basically, and then people recover, basically, or they... Uh, the, in the worst case, they die some in that sense, and eventually the population becomes entirely exposed to the virus or a vaccine is found and so on. So that's more or less it um, in some sense in terms of most of the models. And of course, there's been a big move within the last three or four months to begin to develop these things and to actually build space into it. So the model that uh, uh, I'm talking about here is one that's been built for Devon, the county of Devon. And basically, it's put together several models in that sense, which traditionally have not been put together. It's driven by a micro simulation model of the UK demographic population. Um, th th that is informed by spatial interaction model, people, people moving around, basically, to uh, retailing, to schools, to hospitals, and to work. Um, obviously, in people moving in that sense, using these ideas that I showed earlier on about inverse distance and so on. Uh, and then ideas about how much time is spent in various activities. All of this is brought together um, and built into a risk profile, uh, which gives the possibility of an infection or a person being infected. And then, of course, infecting others. The number they infect, of course, is the so-called R number uh, in this particular context. Um, and basically, then a spatial, uh, um, uh, a spatial pandemic model basically is built uh, at the uh, uh, the small scale, basically, uh, and that is operated to give you a sense of how the how the pandemic spreads across space. Um, there could be many feedback loops in this kind of model uh, between the spatial pandemic model at the end here and those, and there are some basically even in this model. But this is early work in some sense to uh, putting these things together. Different groups should mention that um, the different groups involved in building something like this that leads. Uh, uh, spatial analysis group have built the micro simulation model. Uh, we and uh, Ying Jin and Gang at Cambridge have built the space interaction models. Uh, the time budgeting has been done uh, in uh, Leeds. The uh, uh, spatial um, uh, epidemiology model has been done in Exeter. Um, and, and all of these things are sort of, uh, you know, funded by various sorts of agencies, etc. And of course, related to uh, potentially to government in some sense. Uh, uh, through being able to answer certain questions about the pandemic. Here are some pictures in that sense. And uh, again, I'll rip over these very quickly. The 60-day simulation, uh, the familiar patterns of um, infections, recoveries, uh, susceptibles, mortalities, and so on are actually generated from a model of this kind. 
Now, the last model I'll talk about, and I'm sure that I'm way over time here. Um, I'm wearing a set of headphones, actually, which is not uh, good news. So I can barely hear anything from uh, that's going on in the background. But uh, anyway, I'll quickly go through these. We have a, a workhorse model called the Quant model, which enables us to uh, build a whole variety of different uh, impacts, basically. Uh, the model is built for England, Scotland, and Wales. It's essentially um, a population employment, space and interaction type model. Uh, it's, it works on three modes. That's important, three trouble modes. So if you constrain the public transport mode, that's rail and bus, basically, uh, then the, co the competitive element of that particular model uh, enables, uh, would probably enable people to shift to another mode, basically. So one of the things we're very interested in is when we put in a new rail line, for example, how does it actually impact in terms of travel on the bus system and on the rail si on the on on the car system, basically, in that sense, that's absolutely key. In fact, to uh, the notion of actually capacitating um, certain kinds of transport uh, relative to this social these social distancing things. Now, the model is too elaborate for me to tell you in detail. It's basically uh, various trip distributions which relate employment to population. Uh, and at the same time, uh, associated with that, the movement of uh, wages and uh, house prices, costs, and so on. So there's an economic component of the physical movement component, really, in that context. Uh, here's an example very quickly. This is Greater London, showing you the kind of thing that is predicted from the model in that sense. This is the big model. Um, it can be seen as a, a bunch of web services, basically, in some sense. So there's a, uh, a client side. I should say that this model is built on the web so that you can run it um, immediately, you can run it uh, directly. It's meant to be for policymakers to evaluate scenarios um, in real time, basically, or running it in real time, I should say, uh, in this particular context, it's called, it's called static. These are pictures from the model itself. Um, go through these so in that sense and let me quickly to finish look at a couple of uh, a couple of examples of how we're using it in that sense the, a typical example is uh, is the new high speed line that red line is essentially called crossrail uh, and that's greater london basically from um, the east uh, south end to uh, to um, uh, Reading in the west, uh, west of the airport, basically. So they're building this high-speed, uh, well, tube line itself, but our tubes tend to be almost like heavy rail in Britain, but uh, they're underground for a whole range of historical reasons. Um, they're, they're building this, and of course, the impact of this line is enormous. It's not just on Greater London. It's actually on the country itself, basically, in that sense. You can see here, these are the number of improved journeys. You can see the idea of the line right the way across into Cornwall and South Wales and so on. There are impacts uh, in terms of um, uh, ch changes in terms of improved journeys. This is just on the rail line, on the railway system, basically, which is joined up. Uh, when we look at population change, this is looking at the, at the, uh, the London bit, basically. You can see there's uh, clearly population change in different levels at different levels. Uh, and then actually population change or mode shifting, uh, red being shifting from one mode to uh, from one mode to another, and the blue being loss of uh, uh, transit in that sense, overall uh, loss in that way. This gives you an indication of, uh, of this. Now, the important thing about this model is that we can do this sort of thing for closing down the rail system in Britain and seeing what it has an impact on buses and cars. We can also look at it for uh, changing carbon uh, emissions, etc. Uh, on these different systems. So because it's a competitive system and because we don't really know where these effects will show themselves, basically, it's quite a useful tool in some sense. We're beginning to uh, change notions about technology, capacity, density, and so on and so forth. Here's an example where we've uh, uh, put in high-speed rail between London and the north, uh, etc. And this is the impact on changes in accessibility basically by, by the shift that takes place from car to rail. Now, this is not high-speed rail as uh, it's actually being planned at the moment. We're talking about all lines becoming high-speed rail, basically. So it's a very cavalier type of assumption. Uh, last but not least, this notion about reducing rail to 15% uh, for social distancing in that sense. Uh, then this is our little uh, our, the modal split model, uh, 
uh, in some sense. So you can you don't need to understand the equation. You just think about the fact that uh, rail begins to change in some sense. The distances on rail begin to change. The road and bus remain the same. Uh, so if we put capacities, and the way we introduce the capacities is through the uh, through the, through the distances in, in some sense. So we can actually jack up the distances on rail, for example, to the point where we get about 15% capacity. At the same time, uh, the the movement to the modes, to the other modes, in fact, is taking place in that sense. And we can begin to actually sort of examine this. And the map on the right actually shows an example of that. Okay, where do we go from here? Three, point, three or four points to finish. Um, clearly, we need to uh, figure out how we can... Uh, um, look at uh, these locational patterns at different scales. So uh, adding scales together in that sense is important. We need to add new attributes to our models. We need to figure out how not only physical networks, I've not mentioned electronic networks. Would, if I was giving this talk um, uh, before the pandemic, I'd probably be talking a lot about electronic and physical networks and how they, uh, they link to one another and how difficult it is to actually think of cities in these terms, to actually observe them. But uh, we need to add uh, electronic networks to much of our thinking about how we model and simulate cities. And last but not least, we need to look at this whole question of distance, uh, action at a distance, etc. the idea of spacing and densities in small spaces and how they can actually, how this is actually going to change things in some sense, not only in our models, but actually change things in the way people arrange things in our cities. Um, and this, of course, is going to change our view of space in cities anyway. Even if it were to end tomorrow, it would have an impact on how we think about space. So I'll finish on that point. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and if you need to look at, uh, you give me a plug for my books, basically. So um, uh, the, some of these ideas uh, are woven through the books in this particular context. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Michael. Really right, fascinating okay. stuff, uh, and particularly in, in the context of our project and us talking about rather a culture uh, of congestion than, um, than an issue of congestion, because um, it feels like we got this enormous push to change our cultures now, everyday behaviors uh, with this pandemic. And I will just ask, I think, uh, kind of a broader question that maybe the answer is quite obvious in the academic circles, but just for the general public, they usually, uh, quite often there is um, a desire to create this mega model uh, and a perfect model that would just predict everything and consider every single um, aspect of the city. And my question would be why such a model is intrinsically impossible and how we can actually understand the inventive processes in cities using different models. Okay, well, I, I mean, to some extent, um, uh, there are almost as many models, well, put it this way, there are almost as many theories about how cities work as there are people who are actually studying cities. And now that sounds a bit of a kind of... Uh, a strange way of looking at things. Uh, what I'm really saying is there are many, many different ideas, uh, in, my, in my view, um, all equally legitimate about how you look at different cities. If you like, it's, it's a, it contained in the title of the, of the, uh, of the workshop here, uh, the conference here anyway, the idea of different cultures of cities, cultures of congestion in that sense. So in some senses, the implication is we need uh, we need more than one model, basically. Just we need more than one theory. We need many more than one model. And there are some quite, um, you know, well-established areas of modern life, such as the econometric forecasting. So the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve basically have a vast of models that they uh, use to actually make forecasts. They don't take one model. They take several models. They pull the results. The same goes on. Um, in weather forecasting to some extent, uh, and in many modelling, uh, we've got uh, more than one model. And to some extent, the models compete against one another in a sense. Uh, and this, I think, is wholly right, that, that in, in many senses, no one model is king, basically. Um, and um, each model has something, I think, which brings to the party. Now, that sounds a bit cavalier. It, it, you, you, there, can be, there can be bad things that occur, 
uh, by bringing many models to the party, basically. But in general terms, uh, no one model is right. It was George Box who said that, um, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful, basically. He often said that in, in his various books. Uh, and that's absolutely right, you know, that uh, I think we need more than one model in that sense. Um, thank you very much.